Hello and welcome to the Educators Corner podcast, the show that brings you conversations with educators from all over the world. Conversations where we stay curious for a little longer about the issues, challenges and opportunities which we are facing in our schools and our communities. We are recording this month's episode at Jess Dubai Education Exhibition and Conference. So whether you're walking, running, cooking or just relaxing, I hope that you're ready for a compelling conversation with today's guest, Bill Raithmel, Assistant Principal at Rashid and Latifa School here in Dubai. Apple Distinguished Educator and Author of the Digital Ecosystem. So, we're just getting to that period of time where I think a lot of us had half-term breaks in this part of the world. What was your half-term break like, Philippa? Hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, half term was a bit of a whirlwind. I have two boys and there was a lot of rugby being played, but it was very nice to be less in front of a screen and more kind of active and outdoors. So it was, it was nice. And was there any particular team that was being supported in the, in the world cup recently? Um, well, we watched some of them. We were very disappointed with uh, rugby, the, the England coming out of the rugby because it was just so close so close to the end so they were a bit devastated by that but um and then my youngest keeps making the opposite choices um in terms of who's going to win so if you ever want to to think about who the winning team is you have to do the opposite of what he suggests <laughs> so how do they feel about the overall conclusion of the rugby world cup yeah I, both of them had decided that it would go the opposite way but um but yeah they were quite into it they're getting more and more into it they're kind of at an age at the moment where they're understanding it a little bit older, but perhaps not watching a full match all the way through especially not with some of the time differences here okay so let's get into straight into the podcast today tell us a little bit about your current role Philip. i think the listeners would find that interesting yeah, so i work for the rashid and latifa school here in dubai which is opened by Royal Decree. Um, we are currently working on a task force to reopen that and to think about what that looks like. And my specific role is to do with digital strategy, innovation and learning. And um, very thankfully, I've been taken on because of my book, The Digital Ecosystem, to develop what an interoperable digital system looks like. So exciting. Fantastic. So if you've not read The Digital Ecosystem yet, I can highly recommend it. Uh, I read it um, about a year ago. So maybe first of all, you can tell us what made you write it and then maybe what you mean by a digital ecosystem. Absolutely. So um, I'm very much a visual person. And so the concept in terms of the visual, digital ecosystem is very visual to me. Um, it's all about how schools need to consider the, the school itself as an ecosystem and as kind of a living, breathing environment for learning and, and as any ecosystem requires, it needs things to help it thrive and to help it to be nurtured, especially in terms of the school concept. And for me, the idea of this geodesic dome connected, very much looking outward, but being safe and that secure side, um, but also being able to live with all these different planets and animals and different things like that, very much reminds me of a school where we have our policies, our governance, our structure and the things that we do. We have our safeguarding, so we look outwards and we can keep students safe, but we allow them to test, to try, to push boundaries. And then each and every one of them is so different. Some of them skyrocket to the roof and some of them take a little bit longer and need a bit more light and a bit more nurturing. And then ultimately we let them out into the wider world and, and we hope that what we've done is, is the right thing. And when I moved into the digital side of education about six, probably nearly seven years ago now, there was so much of it that I didn't know and didn't understand and lots of different elements. So I was being taken into safeguarding meetings. I was being asked to develop curriculum. I was looking at how to use it to enhance and innovate in certain ways. We were looking at competitions and engagement and, and then community engagement. And all of those parts felt so standalone, but I was the one that was being requested to kind of do that as the guess the knowledge behind it. And I was learning literally seconds before I was kind of doing some of these and delivering some of these things. And, and I found it incredibly exciting, but also the idea that there is a real safety underlying tone that I felt just wasn't understood. And so throughout the years of, of doing digital strategies within schools and working with schools, I felt it would be really helpful and what I would have loved to have had when I first set out 
would have been a book to sort of tell me how to. And so I guess through COVID and, and also I was very lucky to support a lot of schools through COVID with some outreach programs that the school I was working for at the time did. It allowed me to kind of build these concepts even more and start to talk to people about, you know, what it means to be a school governor, what it means to be a school leader and, and to try and really understand everybody's perspective of it and bring that together. Um, and that's what the book does really. So any sort of stakeholder within a school could read it, pick it up, understand the reasons behind potentially why we need to have certain measures in place, why certain security systems are in place, but also how we can get to that place of innovation and change and development that we need to be at because change is so rapid now in terms of, you know, AI, all of these different elements. We have to be at a certain pace and place for that to be able to happen. And lots of schools aren't even there yet with safe, secure digital systems in their own school. Um, and so my hope is that the book is able to be picked up by people and allow them to understand it a little bit more for them to then go off and do their own research. I think what I particularly liked about the book at first, the last thing I liked about the book was, was this, this concept of the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, if I think back to when I first came across IT in schools was a computer came into the school where I was a student back in the 80s. And then when I was first a, a teacher and head of the department, it was, we've got a computer in our, in our school or in our department, in our team, one computer. And it was all about that one computer, then could we get a second computer? And where we sort of fast forward maybe 20, 30 years now, the complexity of IT in schools is so varied and extensive and so i really like that concept the ecosystem concept because it it captures yeah. the complexity of this world that we've now got within our school environment yeah. so i really i really found the the ecosystem concept really helped them think about mm -hmm. that complexity and then i think as as then we navigate and we help our students to navigate that complex it ecosystem one of the things which I think you pay a lot of attention to in your book, which again I found really of great practical use, was this whole piece around digital safeguarding. Mm -hmm. And as a school, you know, we've done a huge amount of work on safeguarding, mm -hmm. but we've done very little work other than maybe during COVID and we were thinking about online teaching, we thought about digital safeguarding. We hadn't really did a lot of work specifically on digital safeguarding. So I found that bit particularly interesting. And then when, we, when I was delving into that little chapter on, well, quite a big chapter on digital safeguarding, I was really fascinated by this concept of moving from what probably most of us have in schools, unless we're particularly enlightened, uh, but most of us have uh, acceptable user agreements. And we've had those in schools for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. But you just twist that concept a little bit. But I think it's really powerful and talk about responsible user agreements so can you tell us a little bit about the difference between acceptable user agreements and responsible user agreements yeah it was it was actually i, I won't take full credit because it's henry platten who is the founder of go bubble who is hugely into safeguarding and digital safeguarding um but he was the one that brought it up at a safeguarding digital safeguarding conference and it just felt like an absolute light bulb of course when we say to people, don't do that, or what is acceptable, acceptable is, is something that it just, it shouldn't be acceptable to do something wrong if you know it's wrong. Whereas if you're saying it's responsible and you are being responsible as a user, you're always trying to make sure that you're doing the best. And we have all these acceptable use policies and it, it almost makes you question, especially as a student and a child, if you think about the idea of pushing boundaries. If you're a, a teenager where already your brain isn't necessarily considering consequences, if something is verging on the area of, oh, well, it won't be too bad if I do it, then actually you're almost allowing people to break those boundaries and push those boundaries. And, and actually when you find, when you speak to students about it, they are much more accepting and they will take much greater care if you say that you want them to be responsible. They're being responsible for themselves. They're being responsible for their identity. They're being responsible for their device. Because being responsible is what we want to be as humans. Um, we can be acceptable, but that means we can break those boundaries. And I think it's really important that we don't kind of blur that and say that we think that there is a line that is acceptable. We actually want everybody to be responsible 
And also in responsibility, it's about learning, isn't it? And as we get older, children get more responsibility. And with digital systems, as children get older, as we all know, they get more digital systems to be able to look after. So it's really important that we make sure that we keep reminding them that it's their responsibility. It's not anyone else's in that classroom or in that environment. It's actually down to them as an individual. Yeah, fantastic. So I, I, I really like that. And, and that's something that we've uh, already started now to work on at BSM and BSS is moving from acceptable user agreements to this idea of responsible user agreements for all the reasons you've just said. So I think that's a really, it sounds like a simple shift. But I think in terms of the mindset that we want our students to be in and also our colleagues, I think that's a really fantastic step forward, really useful idea. So coming back to our digital ecosystems in our school, we've had a bit of an unexpected visitor, maybe for some of us in the last 12 months. AI is coming into our digital ecosystems. To you, has this been a joy, a meanness, or a depression? How how does, I'm relating back to the previous episode there, if you're wondering, there was a yeah. poem we talked about. Uh, but AI for Philippa, how, what's it meant to you in the last 12 months? In some ways, it's been absolutely fantastic because I think actually, and, and probably most people who are in terms of ed tech and looking after digital technology in their schools will say the same because it's almost pushed technology away from pandemic to the future and this is what's changing and this is what's adapting because there has been a in in certain instances a crawl back away from screens away from digital tools instead of taking it to the next level and saying okay that was one scenario but how can we integrate technology really well in all of these areas to ensure that we keep moving forwards for some of those schools this insurgence of artificial intelligence has said to them you can't stop because if you stop where you were when you came back to school post pandemic, we're going to throw this at you and you're not going to be ready. And so I think in some ways it's really pushed people into thinking a lot more strategically about how they're looking after all of their devices. And one of the things that I think is, is a, is a really powerful part of it is the fact that people are talking about bias. They're talking about privacy. They're talking about data. And they're talking about the security of it because again, quite frequently when you, you speak to, and this is not just educators, but people, we don't read the privacy and data policy when we sign up for an app. People scroll through it, tick the box and send it off. And, and it's those kinds of things that we do need to be thinking about. Realistically, artificial intelligence has been born from all that data that we have shared for years and years that we've not even thought twice about. And so it's really powered with our kind of neglect somehow has sort of cowered some of that. But I think it's really pushed it into the forefront. So I think it's great because it's opened those conversations up. And one of the things that I think it's also opened up is difficult conversations with people who are a little bit more fearful and a little bit more close to it. It again has given them that push to say, okay, I can't ignore this. I need to really consider it properly. So probably a blessing and a and a curse in some ways for some educators just because of the fear of it, really. Um, okay, and on a practical level, can you give us like one example of how you've been using it in the last few months, maybe in the last week even, how yeah. you used it? So we did some work at, at school with it, with our all of our staff, because I'm really keen to make sure that, that all of the school, so in the same way the digital ecosystem speaks about it, is that operations and, and academics are, are hand in hand with how good they use technology and we should all be inspired to be able to use technology to help our work. So the obvious of ChatGPT, we've been using things like that. And actually you'll see it quite frequently. We've got to a point now where it's it's not, you know, you spoke about it in one of your podcasts, it's not cheating to use it. Actually, if we're using it in the right way and we're prompting it in the right way, it's a really helpful tool. So there's that kind of commonality coming through, but then equally in, in the past week, using things like Gamma. So it's, uh, you, you put a prompt into it, but it creates presentations. Or um, I was actually helping my husband the other day build a website. Um, and it was really interesting and quite powerful to see. You put in a few prompts and an image and all of a sudden you have a full page website that has links to different elements and you can build more pages from it. And when you think 
not that I want to put people out of work, but when you think that that would have, you know, five, six years ago cost tens of thousands of pounds, even now it still costs you hundreds of pounds to create a very simple website was done in a couple of minutes from a tool that's free. Um, and obviously you can pay for them and pay extras, but, but for what we did the other day was, was literally two minutes that like totally free website built. Um, so there's lots of really interesting things happening there. And I think when you then put them into the classroom and you say, okay, well, there's your scaffold for a student who finds it really hard to plan. And then they can extrapolate on that with facts and understanding and more information and images of their own. You're helping them to differentiate how, you know, their lesson, their learning, you're kind of being able to say to them, I know that's not a strong point of yours right now. And we're not focusing on you structuring something. What I'm focusing on is content. And if you can make sure the content isn't what the AI generator is giving you, then that's amazing. And then later we can go back and we can say, okay, well, what was good about that structure? So we can almost reverse engineer some of the learning that we can do in our classroom. And I think that's the kind of way that this can be incredible and used really well. Absolutely. And so there's, I think there's a huge amount of excitement around the potential of this to help teachers save time, empower learning for uh, young people in school. Uh, we hope that it can uh, erase some of the, the noises we're hearing in the background now with the post-production of this podcast. We're going to put it with, with, through some AI software and I'm hoping that you won't be hearing that, um, what we've just heard, but you never know. So there's lots of potential for us, for, for it to make us as educators, as teachers, as leaders better and maybe use, uh, spend less time doing some of the work we've done, but also ultimately helping our learners become even more powerful learners. So there's, then that's one side of it. Then the other side of it is the fear factor, the safety, you know, what are the dangers? And I think there was a really interesting paper uh, that was published in August. It was called The Future of AI uh, in Education by three leading academics, which we've probably all heard of, Aaron Hamilton, Dylan William, John Hattie. And they put together this paper. We'll put a link to it in the, in the podcast notes afterwards. And it had a number of recommendations. And I'm just going to read out one recommendation, Philippa. I'd just like to, to, to explore this one, of, uh, one recommendation of 13. So I'll just quote the recommendation. And it says that, recommendation number six in the paper, Systems used by students should always have guardrails in place that enable educational institutions to audit how and where children are using AI in their learning. We should expect that children would require permission from parents and schools prior to being able to access AI systems. So, Let's go back to the first bit of that, that quote, that systems used by students should always have guardrails in place. What, what do you think those guardrails might look like in the AI-empowered or enhanced classroom? So I think it goes back to a few parts. In terms of digital governance, in schools, I do strongly believe that all staff should be fully aware of the governance surrounding digital systems. I'm going to interrupt you there for a moment. Because we've not talked about digital covered governance yet. Okay. I'm not sure all our listeners will be fully aware of that term. Can you just okay. unpack a little bit what yeah. you mean by digital governance? Absolutely. So again, probably won't have heard of it because many schools don't have digital governance. But again, as we've said, it's, it's come along so much. I mean, I remember the one computer actually it had a dust cover on the whole time that it was there. It might not have even been a computer. Um, but those sorts of things and, and we haven't yet gone, okay, what are all the consequences and processes behind this? And it's not about policying everything, but it's about making people aware that when you choose digital systems, we do have to consider whether they're appropriate, whether they have restrictions, whether they are open access, whether they're taking anyone's data. And importantly for us in the UAE, whether their data is being stored outside of the country. Um, cybersecurity here is incredibly specific and the, the policies in terms of legislation here are changing as well. And obviously GDRP across the UK, we do have to consider where things are being taken and where things are being stored, especially with young children. So governance basically says of all the things that we're doing, this is how we want to as a school work to that. And the vision and ethos of our school 
drives that governance and the why behind what we're doing. And ultimately, it's the, the pillars that underpin everything that we choose to do, everything that we operate with, and how those things are going to be used, including things like working parties. So you might have across a school, a whole group of different stakeholders who, who do look at, at, policy, at changing, sorry, not policies, but technology in school to consider best fit. Is something still working? Is it not? Do we need to review it? Should we be looking at those things? So once your governance is in place, one part of that is having those responsible user policies. So those responsible user part of policies are for staff and for students. And in some cases, they're actually for parents as well. And, and you know, one note there was something about parents and actually it's about linking them in. You, you don't want the parents to feel like they don't know what's happening and actually saying to them, these are things that we, we might be doing this year with your, with your child. For instance, you might need to take a photograph. Is that okay? It's the same sort of thing as that. Now, I feel like, you know, the use of, are you happy for us to use innovative technology with your child? Bearing in mind, we are regulated to ensure safeguarding in our school community. I feel that should be enough to say, you've chosen your child to come to our school. You've chosen, you've decided that they will be safe here because we're making the right decisions for them educationally. And so then it comes down to your responsible policies, your responsible user policies that you say to your children and your students, what is responsible? What does that look like? Because actually students will start to say to you, well, actually that says that you shouldn't use it unless you're 13. And then you might have a conversation about why. So why is that website specifically saying that? And what does that mean? So should, is it, is it you know, like you would with a guardian at the cinema? Is it okay if we use it with family? Is it okay if we use it with a teacher? How is that best fit? And also remember that a lot of these sites are, are so new that they haven't necessarily been governed themselves. And so I think those guardrails are important in terms of teachers need to be aware of what they're bringing into a classroom. You shouldn't be putting something in a classroom unless you've tested it. And then the responsible user policies of, am I allowing them to understand fully how to be responsible? Because again, that comes back to us as educators is, do they understand that there are ways to use this in the best way? And do I understand as an educator how to use it in the best way? Um, and I think another guardrail, which might sound really silly, is to actually just have really open conversations with staff about the changes in the digital landscape, because quite a lot of schools will have some staff who don't want to know anything about it. And if we can support those staff to have those conversations, they're more likely to feel confident to have those conversations with students. And ultimately, the more open we are, the more we talk about it the less students are going to want to hide something they've done wrong or a mistake that they've made, and they're going to want to tell you. And so ultimately, it's a fight club safeguarding is just that open community of talking. Excellent. Yeah, and I think um, we've, we've talked about this in the previous two podcasts of Cat Place and the Dampers Factory, the importance of having a sort of open AI classroom, an open AI school where you do talk with your colleagues, you do talk with students, you do talk with parents, and perhaps, you know, coming back to the responsible user agreement, co-constructing the responsible user agreement with staff maybe initially, and then discussing that with students and what do they want to bring to that agreement, and then talking about that with, with parents, that would be a really powerful vehicle for opening up conversations about AI and how it can be used safely. What about policy? And I've been talking about policy now for quite a few months. Yeah, you know, I'm very aware that at my school, we haven't got an AI policy or we haven't adapted any of our policies to AI. So I was really pleased and grateful when I saw at the end of September that Conrad Hughes, Director General of International School of Geneva, he, he shared their school's generative AI policy. And I'm sure that's very much, a, it is a early, early stages, but he was courageous and generous enough to share it with the wider world. He posted on LinkedIn, and we've both had a, a look at that, haven't we? And mm. I just wonder, what, what's your initial take on that, that policy? Um, what do you like about it? Well, I mean, first of all, like you say, the fact that it's being shared, because I think that opens conversations. So I think it also supports anyone who isn't sure, isn't aware of what path to take. It gives them an example, because if we all as education institutes close our doors and say we're not sharing anything, 
how does anyone know if what they're doing is, is good, is right, is, is helpful? So I think that's, that's one thing I would say. Um, and then I think, I think what it gives you is if you are really new to this or if you're in a school where this has really hit you, you know, with you weren't expecting it out of the blue, this gives you a real guidance in terms of some of those ways in which you could construct your policy. Um, I very much think that policy should be very specific to schools and very specific to those environments um, because it, not every school will see technology in the same way and use it in the same way and the same way that we would look at artificial intelligence in different ways. And so I think it gives a structure of possible questions for you to look at and say, that's interesting. I might need to look at that. What does that mean? I've never heard of that. Great stuff. And how would you adapt it for your particular setting then at the moment, do you think? I think from my perspective, I would make it less descriptive because our setting is very much digitally infused and very, we want to be very forward thinking about it. And I think there's a lot of detail there that I would feel that I would have to be changing quite rapidly to be able to keep up with some of those technological advances. And, I, and again, that goes back to what sort of school you are. If you know you need to embed something for quite some time, brilliant. If you are wanting to kind of weave with that time and, and go with that flow, you almost need something that's less prescriptive to be able to allow that to happen. Otherwise, as much as I think like working parties are really important and the governance is important, if you hold it too rigid in some schools, you won't allow some of those teachers to really explore what that means. And if you're not allowing that, you'll get it in silos and you'll get it in secret. And so we want to promote that openness of technology. So for me, I would I'd make it less prescriptive, but then I would stick a responsible user underneath it and say, and actually not having necessarily one for each different part of a digital system, but overall within our digital learning and digital technology, within our responsible user, user agreement, there would be a section that says something about artificial intelligence and the use of to allow it to be able to grow and develop in a, a really natural way. Okay, so I think we've now got two bits of documentation which might help conversations with colleagues, with students, with parents. We've got this wonderful uh, act of generosity from International School Geneva. They they shared the policy. We could we could bring that policy out, put it out there. Here's a, an AI policy from a leading international school. Here's our acceptable user agreement that we've got in place at the moment. Let's look at both these things. How can we maybe adapt this policy to our setting? How can we and also adapt our acceptable user agreement into a responsible user agreement? And I think they, those are two wonderful bits of documentation which can actually generate some really powerful conversations with colleagues, with students, with parents over the next few months. That's maybe enough for AI for now. I'm going to go back to Philippa Raithmail, uh, the school leader and maybe he's a brave build a person. And I'm gonna go into the quick fire round now. I've got a, a few questions for you. So just three, three questions. First of all, around leadership, what is the leadership lesson that you keep on having to learn? I would definitely say communication because I think it's so different for different people. I think one of the biggest things that probably as a middle leader moving into a senior leader, it was understanding upwards and downwards. And then as you kind of come into more of a senior leader leadership role, it's understanding how a range of different people like to be communicated with. And then it, it also helps you to understand who you are and how you like to be communicated with. So I just think, I don't think I'll ever stop learning about communication and especially with the plethora of digital tools out there the ways that could be used to communicate is is just amazing. But yeah, I think that's always something that we all as leaders. It is, it's, it's interesting how that becomes probably more and more of a thing as you, you move into move through leadership is the understanding more and more about the art and the science of communication. It never stops to fascinate, yeah. fascinate me and trip me up from time to time. So complete the sentence, being an educator in the Middle East is one of the best jobs in the world because? Because it 
is open to so many possibilities. I remember when I first arrived here and thought, there's just so many things that you can do and so many people willing to say, try it, see what happens. How does that, you know, how will that work? What will that work? What are the possibilities of that? Um, so I think it's a very innovative part of the world and that especially in my sector of education is incredible. Fantastic. Yeah, I think many challenges, but also a, a region of, of great opportunity. And finally, one thing that you're grateful for right now is? Educationally, I would say the community of EdTech innovators globally. I never felt so welcomed and so supported. And anyone who was in that kind of group of people, we throw questions at each other and immediately responses come flooding back. And I think there's such a brilliance around that of, of that kind of no, no barriers in terms of wanting to, to keep things to ourselves. Um, it, it's what got me on the road to being able to, to be where I am and to publish the book, but it's also where I now like to make sure that I give back and there is just such an amazing community of educators out here. There is. It's true. And uh, I think there's a wonderful community of educators uh, around the world, not just in this region. And it's just been great, the response we've been getting over the last few weeks to, for example, this podcast. That brings us to a close now. Thank you very much, Philip, for, for joining us on the Educators Corner podcast this month. We've been discussing what the guardrails might look like as we explore our AI-enhanced digital ecosystems how we might create responsible use agreements and how all our schools might soon be safe and even more exciting places to learn as they are enhanced with AI. So thank you, Philippa. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. And uh, we look forward to the next episode of the Educators Corner podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to the Educators Corner podcast, the show that brings you conversations with educators from all over the world. The podcast where we stay curious for just a little bit longer. The Educators Corner podcast is hosted by me, Kai Vasher, and produced by Stuart Pardo, Zoe Snell, and Marion James, and by BSM BSS Productions.